Hi and welcome. So this time around we've got some quick shot projects and it's sort of a continuation of my last quick shot projects uh, wherein one of the projects was to drill and tap the center of the half inch 13 bolts that hold the vice jaws on a curt vice. And uh, I believe I did it 1032 and uh, it allowed you to add accessories to the vise without unbolting the vise jaws, which can be really handy. Um, I got that idea from Tom Lipton over at Ox Tools, as both of the, as his, as includes both of the projects I'm gonna do this week on, uh, uh, on my quick shot projects. Uh, Tom Lipton showed on his channel recently making one of these uh, tools. He first showed a video where he was using the tool and then everyone asked him, hey, that's a really neat tool. Can I get more information about it? What it is, is, a block in his case of A2 tool steel that fit on top of the surface grinder with a 45 cut out of well a 90 cut out of it at 45 degrees a little bit of the apex of the point or the point of a part will stick through a little cutout and the surface grinder wheel behind is behind there and you just run your part across and it will put a perfectly even chamfer on your part which is a really handy tool if you want a very nice ground surface uh, chamfer on it and uh, Tom's was made out of A2 tool steel, I believe, uh, but uh, he showed a new version for the masses uh, that used mostly Delrin for the top and then a bottom piece here made out of cast iron. And uh, I changed the design a little bit. I'll get into that a little bit later uh, for a couple of reasons, but uh, Tom was very generous. And if you email him, uh, he will send you this drawing and you can make one of your own. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with his design. Um, I just uh, took it and made some changes to it to suit my particular needs. And I'll get into that in just a few moments. But in order to make this part, he had another part. So if you remember those tapped uh, hole, drilled and tapped uh, holes in the Kurt Weiss screws, um, he used that to attach parts like these. Uh, these are this is a 45 pair of 45 plates here, and uh, uh, what these are for is to hold really large parts. So normally, when you hold something at 45 in the Kurt vise, you would take something like these guys here. Uh, these are really small, uh, unfinished, waiting to be ground uh, V blocks, and you put them in the Kurt vise, set your part in there and uh, you only have a very small area of support. It raises quite a bit off the bottom of the vise. This is like three quarters of an inch here. And uh, these are really small ones. If you use larger ones, you'd be over an inch, which means you're really using the vise to only clamp about three quarters of an inch of your part. Um, these guys, however, um, you can arbitrarily decide how close to the bottom you want them. I happen to choose half inch and they support three inches of the part. Uh, this is a set of 45, so this is a 90 degree cutout here. And again, these should be made out of tool steel. Um, I didn't have any, and uh, I didn't want to wait to order some. Uh, it's absolutely not ideal, but I uh, surface ground just some uh, mild steel. These are two 3 8 inch uh, sheets here, and these are currently uh, uh, ground to size or cut to size and then ground uh, just so I had a nice finish on it But they scratch so easily so it's definitely not ideal if you want to do this You might want to consider carburizing them and then regrinding them um, This is I just wanted to get this part done So I have I'm going to order some tool steel and I'll probably remake these very same parts, but uh, I'll show you I've got them clamped together because all the operations pretty much can be done together with both parts So I ground them together. I cut them together and I'm going to drill them together So changes to what Tom had Tom had the two screws uh, Drilled and tapped and countersunk uh, in his I believe um, I have added two more holes in here that are going to be drilled and reamed and then what they're for is the way Tom showed when you put these two vice jaws in you tighten one and then use the other one with your part to align the other jaw. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I just thought I'd try to use some 3 8 inch pins uh, to align the, align the jaws and see how that worked out. Maybe there'll be enough wiggle. I'm gonna try and make this a fairly snug fit, um, but hopefully it'll help align the jaws pretty accurately. We'll just see. Um, I know this height is really weird, this 2.612. It's completely arbitrary. Well, almost arbitrary. I decided to, why not make three inches of surface area there? Um, that was just a choice. These protrude up above the vice jaws on the Kurt by a fair amount. Uh, their Kurt jaws are about 1.75. So this is almost a full inch above the vice jaws. You could choose to make them flush with the Kurt, top of the Kurt if you want. Um, anyways, this is just the approach I took. Then as for 
the chamfering tool, I modified that as well because Tom's design, although extremely good, um, only supported, I think, seven inch wheels. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, but I have modified my de his design to suit my need, which my surface grinder supports up to eight inch wheels. And believe it or not, when you use an eight inch surface grinding wheel, you get 25% more volume of abrasive than a seven inch wheel because as you increase the radius, it increases, the volume increases by the square uh, because the area increases by the square and the cross section is going to be the same. Uh, anyways, uh, so I made, I redesigned his part from scratch using his idea completely. And I modeled an eight inch wheel and a seven inch wheel. And uh, I wanted to see how much of the wheel I would get suspended in this, uh, in this cavity here. So anyways, my drawing is based on this design. Uh, I bought my material based on his original design and I changed my mind several times. So I only bought, uh, this is uh, four inches high here and this is four and a quarter inch stock uh, cast iron. Found that at Speedy Metals, if you care. Uh, but he used uh, Delrin for that and then had a screw-on piece on the bottom. And what that gave him was a way to clamp this guy, or well, magnetically attach it to the mag vise on his uh, surface grinder. This would obviously go directly. And you'll notice I still have the drill and tap holes here. And that's because uh, this guy may be not tall enough for other parts. And so if I just change my mind later, I've put all these on normal uh, spacing and so that I could build an extension plate that would bolt onto the bottom that would raise this up a little bit in case I need to do larger parts and chamfer those edges. So this is gonna be sort of an interesting round robin project uh, because uh, these guys, when I make these first, I'm gonna use these to hold this. And when I'm done making this part, I'm gonna chamfer these sharp edges in the chamfer tool. So hopefully you find this interesting. So let's head on over to the mill and let's do some uh, drilling first on this guy. First up, we're gonna drill the relief hole in the center here. So it's at a half inch on the Y axis. So I'm also gonna drill and, ta uh, drill and ream these 2.375 holes. Next up, I'm going to do the countersink. That goes in 200,000 deep. Uh, this countersink is part of an inexpensive set I bought, and uh, it's kind of crappy. So I had to actually take every single one except two of them out of the seven or eight pieces and uh, grind this to actually be the uh, body drill size for the appropriate size screw that these are. I mean, this is designed for number 10 screws. This was oversized. Every one of them was oversized. So I guess they were expecting a lot sloppier holes. I don't know. So it should just end up being perfectly symmetrical. Alrighty, so that leaves a fair amount of deburring to do, uh, which I will do off camera and uh, then I will uh, bring you back. I'm also going to do some layout lines. I'm going to cut out the bulk of this material in the bandsaw. One interesting feature about choosing this dimension at three inches is my angle blocks that I have are exactly three inches. So when I line them up with the inset on the drawing that I have uh, measured off over here, uh, they just line up perfectly and I can do some layout lines just to cut with the bandsaw, which is where I'm headed next. All right, so I know you've seen the rolling saw work like this where it self feeds into the work, but you can also use it as a fixed bandsaw, which is one of the reasons I chose this type of saw because it's dual purpose. So let me set it up that way and I'll show you. Now with the fence removed, you put the blade all the way forward and use this locking bit right here to hold it forward. Now you've got a traditional bandsaw, albeit the table's not as big as some, but, you know, with everything, this is a compromise. It was never designed to be the best solution in this particular configuration, but it works reasonably well. Um, your throat distance is reduced because this is canted at a 45 degree angle. Uh, but on the flip side, it lets you do cutoffs. So I took the parts over to the bandsaw and I cut out the majority material here. 
And then I took it over to the mill and I machined these surfaces to final dimension. Now originally I wanted to uh, surface grind these, but what I didn't take into account when I was choosing this three inch dimension here was this depth from the top and the fact that my surface grinder, when you turn this 45 degrees, this part's going to stick way up. So you take this part, put it in the surface grinder, put it at 45 degrees so this is parallel to the magnet. You've got this huge piece sticking up here. And guess what? Even with an eight inch wheel, I can't reach here. So that was uh, a poor design choice if you wanted to surface grind this. Uh, what I ended up doing was just milling it out, but also the quarter inch hole as relief. Um, what I tried to use to make the surface nice was a face mill, uh, which I needed more relief. So I made this half an inch instead of quarter inch. And I just uh, machined this using uh, the face mill instead of uh, surface grinding like I wanted to. If I wanted to surface grind it, I was going to have to cut this guy off at 45 or so, and maybe even down a little, maybe take this down to two and a half inches. So I decided uh, not to, and I just went with this, because since I'm going to remake this in tool steel, I'll know for next time. Uh, but here's the final parts. And uh, obviously this is a pretty big relief hole, didn't need to be. The finish isn't exactly what I wanted, but it, it's not bad at all. Um, the rest of it was surface ground and the pins fit nicely. So we're gonna use this coming up. So next up, we're going to move from this guy uh, to the chamfer tool itself. And remember that piece of uh, cast iron I started out with very rough. I uh, machined it down and then took it over the surface grinder and ground it to final dimensions just for practice since I have never done that. And uh, it turns out it's pretty challenging to get it really accurate. This is within, I think, two tenths of any dimension on here. Um, did it need to be that accurate? Absolutely not. Total waste of time if I was doing that. This was just a, a way for me to practice. Also, um, I get the idea of tool steel because even the cast iron, I don't know if you can catch that, scratched as I was uh, sliding it around on the wooden stool, uh, just measuring it with uh, calipers. Uh, still managed to scratch it with a little bit of uh, grit probably sitting on the tool over by the surface grinder. So cast iron is going to scratch uh, pretty easily, unfortunately. Uh, hardened tool steel probably wouldn't be so much. But in any case, it was a good experience and uh, it taught me uh, a lot about trying to grind something to height. Also getting it flat, square, and parallel was also a challenge and uh, new skills I needed to learn. So again, it took quite a few hours to do this. Uh, no need at all. So if you just want to get us on the mill, you know, mill the, use a fly cutter or a face mill or an end mill and get this dimension, it'll be more than close enough because there's no reason for any accuracy of any of this. Uh, so next up, we're gonna take this guy over and we're gonna drill the, uh, the weight reducing holes in it. Uh, we're gonna drill and tap first. We're gonna drill and tap these holes on the bottom. Now I included these on mine in case I wanna make a riser block later, later on because right now, uh, when the, this is set up on the uh, surface grinder, you can only chamfer parts that go, you know, that fit between here and here because here would be the mag base. And I guess you could put this all the way at the edge of your mag vise so it would hang over a little and get a little more area. Um, but just in case I ever wanted to raise it up so I could do slightly taller parts, uh, I'm just going to drill and tap the bottom for that reason. Uh, that's probably completely unnecessary in my case. Uh, Tom did it on his design so that he could attach cast iron to the bottom of the uh, Delrin. Uh, I don't need that, but uh, in any case. Uh, and I've got one other idea here that uh, I haven't actually uh, attempted yet, but what I'm thinking I'm going to do is I'm going to put a hole right in here all the way through and have a thumb screw that goes down uh, through the part. And uh, this will hold a uh, diamond, uh, diamond dressing stone so that I can uh, dress my wheel vertically with this tool so I don't have to get my dresser drop it way, you know, because this is really tall. And when you're trying to crank a 50 thousandths of revolution, you're trying to crank your wheel down to get to my uh, wheel dresser, which is really low to the mag table. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a pain. It takes a lot of extra work. So I'm thinking I'm going to uh, drill a hole right through here and uh, put a thumb screw so I can tighten it down and put my diamond dressing tool that I can pop in here uh, right into this tool so I can just dress the wheel, pop over, do my chamfering. Because if you're doing a lot of chamfering, you're gonna need to redress that wheel at some point, and this will help reduce that. So maybe that's a good idea, maybe not, we'll find out. Because none of the dimensions on this part as far as hole positions are super critical, 
I used my flip up vice stop to set my zero. So when I do my four holes on the bottom or six holes on the bottom drill and tap those, uh, I can flip this part on its side and drill the other holes all referenced off of this point and it'll save me some time. Um, normally you would probably want the part symmetrical in the vise, but again, nothing here is ultra precision location wise. So uh, this will be more than adequate. Uh, so we're, we're good here and uh, we're just gonna drill and tap the uh, six uh, holes in the bottom of this part. And they're based off the center line. So like if this was really critical, um, in case your dimensions were wrong width wise, you would find the center of your part and then do plus or minus off the center line. And that would mean that your, whatever you attached here would always be centered on the part. Uh, but in my case, I drew, I ground this within two tenths of an inch. So it's very accurate. Um, not that it matters anyways, it's all just for appearances anyhow. Um, so <laughs> just some thoughts. Holes are drilled and tapped. Next, we're going to flip it on its side and we are going to do the big holes. The beauty of cast iron is it makes wonderful chips that clear the hole pretty nicely. Unlike some other gummy stringy metals like uh, stainless. Oh, yeah, I'm starting to recut chips. This is a two and a quarter inch long annular cutter. So it should be able to go all the way through, but the chips are going to kind of get jammed up. So we're through and there's the first slug. A uh, nice slug of cast iron. Actually, the service finish is surprisingly good considering this holder, this inexpensive Chinese holder has a little bit of run out in it. Uh, I could see it. It's probably like 10 thousandths or more. Uh, I, I don't like that at all, but uh, you know, you get what you pay for sometimes. And uh, I guess I got a little of a substandard part there. We're done with the uh, weight relief holes and here are the slugs that came out of the middle. It is a little bit of weight. I've got to deburr these edges here. Although I got to say cast iron does not turn up much of a burr. Just a little one. You can just feel with your fingernail. Um, not much of one. Uh, so next we're going to start hogging out material. We'll leave this 45. Now we're going to utilize the angle blocks I made. And uh, one thing I did not think of while I was changing my design um, that I lucked out on, which also should have been careful, is that the capacity of the Kurt Weiss is a little bit uh, around nine inches, I think, on the inside of the jaws. You could uh, flip the jaw backs around and have much higher capacity if you're sitting on top, but then you're only grabbing by a little bit here. Um, I made this eight inches long, which means that uh, it uh, just barely clears. <laughs> so that was lucky. Okay, I got it snug and I loosened it up. So let's see how well my pin idea works. That looks like it's a little... Uh, this one's fine. Um, I had some problems when I was reaming this one and I had to uh, uh, ream it in the vise and with a hand drill and that is never a good idea. I should have taken it back here, set it up because that is not a good alignment at all. Has a lot of slop. Okay, so that actually worked out pretty well. It would have been better if the ream, my, my secondary reaming uh, operation hadn't been so unfortunate. So now I can just tighten these guys up. And incidentally, any particular angle you need in here, you can make. So that's a pretty handy feature.
So as you can see, really nicely supported there on those two angle blocks. They get it pretty low to the bottom, which is very nice, uh, so that I'm clamping on more of the material that I'm interested in. Um, again, I, don't, I didn't need all this extra material, so I probably should have made it shallower. Then I could have used my surface grinder and ground these. So when I do the ones out of A2, I will do that. All right, so to get my zeros, I'm using a technique that's not good for precision. So I've got a 21 thousandths uh, shim stock on the peak here, and I'm setting my Z depth that way. Um, I'm going to use the, the part in the back here, this edge here, to find my X dimension. Uh, if this were critical, both of these have been, uh, you know, rounded off a little bit so they're not sharp, which means they're no longer accurate because that relies on a perfectly sharp point uh, for that edge where the two planes intersect. And uh, we don't have that. If this was really critical, I would use a tooling ball or something like that to find more orientation. So to get dimensions, I don't know if you can see this. Let's see. Let me turn off the light here. I... Uh, I started with my drawing vertically, and then I took the drawing and rotated it 45 so that uh, the part I'm cu cutting is perpendicular to the ground. And then I used CAD to do the measurements, so figure out how far down I have to plunge. Total 1.42 inches, and it's going to be 0.8362 from the back. I'm going to start with a roughing end mill, as you can see here. In order to get enough travel, I uh, slid my head out this way, about an inch and a half which was no problem. I had the range and the Y travel is now enough. This is gonna make a huge mess. So when I do this uh, in any, any serious capacity coming up, I'm gonna use the vacuum cleaner while I go, but to show you, I'm gonna turn it off. I don't know if I'm taking too big a bite. I'm taking about four tenths of an inch. Uh, it's not a very tall, uh, not a very wide bit. So let's just see how that goes. This is a roughing mill. So, oh, it's gonna make a huge mess. Okay, that's working great, but uh, it, like I said, it's making a huge mess. So I am going to uh, use a vacuum cleaner while I do this, so you're not gonna wanna hear that. I'll bring you back. I made a novice mistake here, and I thought about it before I started. I thought, nah, this won't be a problem. Well, you can see how there's quite a difference here between this plateau and this plateau. And all I did was go there and come back again. Uh, on this side, they're perfectly even. The cutter was sucking down into the work, and that's because I was using an R8 collet uh, that was just stupid. Instead, I should have been using a weld and flat style collet. And I thought about it and I thought, oh, there's not that much force on a roughing. I just was completely wrong. So now I've also lost my reference point. So I'm gonna have to find another one to set my Z zero. Uh, fortunately, this is not a super critical part dimensionally or I would be totally hosed. All right, there's the groove roughed out. I was taking full depth passes, which is, I don't know, a little bit over an inch. And I was taking the, let's see, what is it? It's really, yeah, about, no, about 850 thousandths depth of cut by quarter inch wide, just full passes the whole time. Uh, climb cutting, you could really feel it, try and pull the table, but my table's pretty tight. So I just uh, moved the hand wheel very slowly and it uh, did a nice job. This is a high speed steel cutter. And so it did deflect a little bit. So on the back pass, coming back to climb mill again, um, you could feel it uh, remove a bunch more material on the way back because it was obviously deflecting. Um, anyways, uh, good job on the roughing. So I am going to come back with a uh, finishing end mill and I am just going to uh, bring it within a couple thousandths of each direction. That way I can uh, take it over to the surface grinder and grind those nice and smooth. There's the surface finish difference between the roughing end mill and the finishing end mill, and you can see it's uh, significant. This is just a reflection down the middle here. It's actually very nicely smooth. All right, so there's the finishing end mill passes. Uh, then I'll take it over the surface grinder and clean this up, which will make it look really nice. Uh, but I think the next step I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the slitting saw and cut the slot down for the relief for the corner of any part you're gonna be sliding on it so burrs don't push the part out. We're gonna run out of this blade, in this blade. Oh, didn't even consider that. 
Well, there's a stupid for you. So I thought I checked everything very carefully. What I forgot to look at was the bottom of the nut, which actually was intersecting the part and I couldn't see it from until I got just the right angle. Damaged my beautiful finish. Gotta have a screw up in every part, don't I? I guess that's the way you've got the secret path out of the maze. Uh, for those rug makers out there that didn't want to weave their soles into the rug, they always made a mistake so they could find their way out. <laughs> that's a bad excuse, but I'm going to go with it. So we're on our last steps here. So next up, we're going to flip the part around like this, and we're going to remove the pocket on the back where the, uh, the grinding wheel will fit. And then looking at this, I think there's going to be enough meat looking at the side profile. I am going to drill a hole all the way through this guy and then drill and tap from the top. I'm going to uh, mount a diamond dresser in here. And I'll probably have to cut the shank down a little bit because this will be too long. Um, but it'll make it really convenient because I can just drop my wheel down, dress the side of the wheel, and then go. I think that'll be really nice. I've got a spare grinding, uh, I mean, a dressing stone here. It's a 0.15 carat. So it should last a while. I think we'll be good. Well, here's another order of operations uh, lesson I just learned here. So now that this is not, is not even with this any longer, when I go to hold this and I'm going to be milling on this side, I got to be careful because it's going to want to push down and there's nothing right under the milling cutter to support it. That was brilliant on my part. I should have milled the pocket first, then come back and uh, done the 45 last. Uh, because I could have found some lower material to support the 45 on, uh, but the uh, the reverse is not true. So I'm kind of hosed there. That was brilliant. Nice thinking ahead. So to help support this, uh, instead of the parallel, I went with a couple small bolts. I actually had to grind down the threads quite a ways. Got some beefy nuts here that are sort of flat on top. I think I need to make something like this because uh, I'm going to run. This is not the first time I'm or the last time I'm going to run into a problem like this, my guess. To try something different this time. Last time we used the, uh, the fine rougher. This time we're going to use a coarse rougher. And uh, we're going to go into back gear. And we're going to shoot for like 250 RPM. And we're just going to see how it cuts. So I'm going to go a quarter inch depth of cut uh, out of the total of uh, 0.645 we have to go deep. And uh, see how that works. Of course, we're going to finish it with a nice end mill. But uh, we're going to start with this one for now. And I'm going to use a vacuum when I do this. So I'm going to start you off by showing you uh, what it does. And uh, obviously I learned my lesson this time. I'm not putting in a regular collet so I don't get the uh, thing to cut to suck, the milling cutter to suck out. See, even I can learn. So we're going to try and go in, I don't know, maybe a quarter of an inch just to see what it's like here. Oh, that's, so far that's cutting very easily. Well, let's see what it's like. Uh, that's like a half inch. So we uh, finished uh, this and I made a mistake when I was using the end mill. I decided to finish with the car, the rougher because I liked the finish, but it was a little tough on the bottom surface, especially on the sharp edge. So it was fine when the cutter was going this way across the edge, but coming back this way across the edge, there were a little bit, there were a little bit of chip out, um, which I don't like, uh, but I'll fix that with some sandpaper after. It's a nice fit. There's actually, this is a metric sized uh, uh, dressing tool. So this was the closest I had. I didn't even have a metric that was close because it wanted something like 9.9 .9 millimeters. But uh, this will work. I'm just gonna cross drill and tap this way. So I'm gonna take this part and I'm gonna flip it up here and uh, we'll go from there.
Here's the finished part. There's my screw up when I was doing the slitting saw, which is really unfortunate. And uh, there's the grooves that aren't as beautiful because I started at one depth then started inching down and so they crossed off they were all lining up nicely it was beautiful it isn't anymore so that's not great i could take a finishing end mill and clean this up at some point there's my set screw with my dressing uh, tool built into the back of this which i think is a nice addition and uh, let's head over to the surface grinder and give this guy a shot there are the drilled and tapped holes on the bottom all right so here we are with the part on the surface grinder I've got a parallel behind it to space it off of the fence. I've got the dressing tool all set up, as you can see back there. There's the dressing tool, so the first thing I'm gonna do is dress the wheel vertically. Now this may not be the best wheel for deburring. I'm gonna have to play with that. I really am not sure. So we're gonna just uh, dress the wheel real quick, and then we will come back and we will try this guy out. Again, maybe the wrong wheel. Maybe a wheel with uh, a uh, better density might be a better choice don't know so like i said we'll give it a shot now we've got to center this guy up Then bring this in till just before it touches. So before you use this, of course, I recommend you test out. And that's a pretty nice chamfer. And again, this wheel may not be ideal. So I don't know if you can see that. That's kind of a pretty chamfer there. So, now these are kind of long parts, so in order to do these, <laughs> so I've just discovered that I need this guy forward in order to do this. So I need to add another parallel and bring the whole table forward so these guys can hang off the edge. Or I could use, you know, build the riser block I talked about. So I'm going to reset and I'll bring you back. I've got this set up again and I'm ready to do the chamfers. And there's a burr on this one end I gotta take care of. And there you go. Beautiful finish. <laughs> I might have come too far forward, let's see. I don't think this is the ideal wheel for this. Just uh, talking out loud, I think a, a finer wheel would be better. So there you go. You can see the beautiful edge, hopefully. And yeah, this wheel's turning up a little bit of a burr on the edge. So I'm gonna fix that. So bigger parts will be challenging. And there you go. A really nice even chamfer, especially in the corners. I don't know if you can see that. Um, again, different wheel, I think, but the tool's working just like Tom Lipton said it would. Very, very pleased. So I hope you find it useful. Hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching.